just right after the approval of the permit, so I maybe she was at least waiting because she's in the room, and if it's not done in one hearing, like, ah, oh, I really need to mm -hmm. bring it in. Yeah. In attendance are Ken Hall, Larry Osborne, Cynthia Andrews, Carrie Linder, Nick Dirkman, and Scott Edwards. Library staff, Maureen Cole and Denise Butcher. Our first item is approval of the minutes from last month, which you should have all received last week. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Move to approve. Second. All those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The minutes are approved. And we'll move on to our next item, a presentation by Youth Services Department. And I'll let uh, Mo introduce them. Great. Um, thank you so much, Scott. And I'm really um, Honored to introduce our fabulous Youth Services Librarian to you tonight. This is Barrett Miller, and she is going to tell you all about what she does in the Youth Services Department and uh, what's going on this summer as well. Take it away, Barrett. Thank you, Mo. So, hi. Thanks for having me tonight. I'll try to cover the information quickly, but not too quickly. I can definitely talk fast if you need me to slow down. Please just let me know, and if you have questions, feel free to ask as we go or save them till the end, whatever's most comfortable for you. So I wanted to start off by talking about who we are. Um, we're also we're very big fans of silly photos. This is from our end of summer reading teen 80s party last year. So I'm the youth services librarian. Um, I'm a full-time 40-hour-a-week employee. Um, I manage all of our services for children age birth through high school seniors. I have a master's degree in library science from the University of Illinois. Um, and then our other permanent person who's assigned to youth services is Sabrina. She's um, a library assistant three. She's there 32 hours a week. While her position doesn't require a master's degree, she does have one from San Jose State. Um, and she brings a lot of additional expertise to the role that um, we might not otherwise have. And then the rest of the work that we do is done by about 16 on-call library assistant ones. Um, all of them have some sort of experience working with children. Some have been preschool teachers, K-12 teachers. Um, have worked in bookstores or after school programs with youth. Um, so they have some experience that they bring um, to the table. They all have completed some basic training in providing youth services and we have bi-monthly professional development trainings to help them maintain their skills. So we definitely run a skeleton crew at the library. Um, you know, Westland across the river has three of me and three of Sabrina as well as the um, a team of on calls so I think it's a pretty as you'll see we do a lot with the staff we have and I think it's a pretty big testament to the work that we do the work that our on calls do which is sort of above and beyond the regular call of duty and um, the work that everyone else in the library does to come together and make our youth services programs happen so what we're responsible for as I said at the beginning is um, children birth through high school graduation I had a very tiny baby just a few weeks old um, in the library today who came in with older siblings for the first library visit. Um, so we really do go all the way down to the little littles. Um, so we help children, their families, caregivers, educators, um, and teens find books and information in the library. We plan and provide events for children, teens, and families. We have seven programs that we do um, every single week as well as our big annual summer reading program and special events throughout the year. Uh, we have our teen advisory group that's a leadership and volunteer program for um, middle and high school students 
um, Sabrina and I select books for the children's collection and the teen collection, and then we uh, visit schools, community organizations, um, host groups, um, visiting the library, any other group that's serving children, we find ways to connect ourselves with those facilities and with the kids in those programs. And then Sabrina and I also serve on a variety of local committees um, to improve um, resource and information sharing countywide. So to break this down into the number, by the numbers, I sort of projected out for what we have planned and um, what we can estimate for the end of the fiscal year. And so in the, um, by the end of June, we will have answered over 2,500 questions about finding books and other information in the children's room. We will have provided over 275 programs attended by over 10,000 people. Um, we will train and supervise nine uh, teen volunteers who will provide 350 hours of service to the library. Um, we'll purchase over 3,000 books for kids and teens. We're currently doing first grade field trips this year, so we will host uh, 600 students at the library for a field trip. Um, and then between the two of us, we will have served on five local committees through um, libraries in Clackamas County, which has several um, advisory committees. Um, I'm also going to be serving on the County Early Childhood Committee and um, Sabrina and I have also begun working more closely with the school district uh, media assistants who work in the school libraries. So that is a lot of stuff that happens. Um, so what we do every week, we have um, six different story time sessions for a variety of age groups. Sabrina provides two of them, I provide three, and we bring in an outside uh, presenter from Portland Early Learning Project to do baby signs. Uh, we have a variety of age ranges that are sort of our develop, like this is how the age we plan the program for, but a variety of ages are welcome to attend. Um, and we also have Art Lab every early release Wednesday. Um, it's a process-based art program um, for all ages. We do have um, caregivers uh, um, and adults with developmental disabilities um, who participate as well, although as you'll hear, I believe Jen's coming, is it next month? to present, or Gina's, Gina's, Gina's coming. coming. They're doing some really wonderful and exciting things serving adults with um, a variety of disabil disabilities, including adults with developmental disabilities. Um, so they will, um, we're going to be expanding um, our art offerings to adults as well. Um, so we have these seven programs that we offer every week except for a couple weeks in the summer and over winter break. And we have about 200 people every week who come to these seven events. We recently had to cap our story time sessions because we um, last month we had almost 40 children for one and we just could not fit everybody in the room. So we're very busy. Uh, we have a couple events that we offer every month. Uh, we have Lego Lab on the second Saturday of the month. Um, kids get to come in for an hour to build Lego creations. We give them open-ended prompts. Um, it's a great way to teach them creative um, uh, problem-solving skills, creative thinking. Um, and then we also put their Legos on display in the children's room, which they're all very excited about. They like to watch me put the sculptures away um, <laughs> for entertainment. Um, and then we also have Read to the Dogs that happens twice a month. So we have two different therapy dogs, Oakley, who's a Newfoundland, and Igbo, who's a lab mix. And they come for about an hour and a half um, each month. And um, it's just a drop-in program. Kids can sit down and read to the read to the dogs or listen to a story. It's great because the dogs are really chill. They're very comforting. Um, and they're great for kids who are struggling readers because they're a non-judgmental audience and then they're also a very, a very reassuring presence. And so it helps kids become more confident. Plus they just get to cuddle dogs and it's nice. Oakley is 150 something pounds and enormous and very fluffy and we love him a lot. We love Igbu too, but he's, he's, he's just, he looks like a normal dog. Oakley looks like something out of a fairy tale. Super dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we offer events for families as well. Um, and this year we started one Saturday a month doing some sort of special program for families where we bring in an outside presenter and do something um, <coughs> a little different from our regular offerings. Um, our most popular one by far this year was Steve's Creature Feature. He um, is a reptile handler who comes out and does reptile education shows with lizards and snakes. Um, and this is uh, Buttercup. Um, an albino python who is probably 10 feet long um, and the kids all got to hold her and they just loved her and it was really funny how some kids were super into the snakes and their parents were having to hide in the hallway because they're like I don't want to pass my fear down to my child but oh my god I can't be in the same room as a snake <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it was, it was very fun. Uh, we also had Alexander, Master of Marvels, come and do a magic show, sleight of hand, which kids were also super into. Although, I mean, nothing taught. We were having to, like, cycle people through Steve's Creature Feature because we had 75 kids who wanted to meet a snake. <laughs> and then we had Storybook Ballet, where a local ballet school came out, and they read a story about ballet, and then they taught the kids some basic ballet stuff. And it was basically 30 little kids dressed in tutus, frolicking. Um, quite horrible. <coughs> Um, we also this year have started offering more programs for what we're calling our young teen age group, which is about 10 to 14. So old enough that they don't want to be grouped in with the babies. Um, they have more, you know, responsibility, um, executive functioning skills. Um, but they're, you know, not quite independent enough that they're, you know, you know, out doing stuff on their own. They still rely on their parents to get them to the library. So that we have this group that wants to be doing a lot of the stuff the older kids are doing, but they're not quite developmentally there yet. So we've been offering some special programs targeted just for them. Um, our, some of our most popular ones are we did LED holiday cards where we taught the kids about how electrical circuits work. Um, so we got you know basic card templates, uh, coin cell batteries, LED lights, and copper tape and used it to make a paper circuit so that they could then light up a, um, a card using really basic electrical technology, which was about the limit of my um, scientific and engineering skills. I was very, very proud of myself. Um, and then we brought in um, someone who has worked with libraries throughout the county named Liberty Rich to do needle felting with the kids. And so they did needle felted cakes and had so much fun doing that. Um, absolutely loved it. So we're doing more and more hands on crafting, STEM, making programs for that age group of upper elementary school kids, young middle school kids. Uh, partly because they're really hungry for opportunities to do this sort of thing. Um, there's not a lot of other opportunities necessarily for this age group. And um, partly because it's an age where kids can kind of get disconnected from the library. And so it's a good way to keep reeling them back in. Um, so we have our teen advisory group. Um, we currently have nine tags who are um, seven uh, students in grades 7 to 12. And they are uh, library volunteers. Um, so they volunteer one hour each week at the library. They do basic shelving, other projects that um, we need. It's a great way to help them develop job readiness skills. They have to learn how to, you know, pay attention to their work schedule and call out if they're sick. And, you know, kind of if they're not liking their assignment, you know, talk to us about, you know, making that work. And so it's a really good way to help them sort of prepare for jobs. And I've uh, done this um, at my previous library as well. And it's the kind of thing when they go out, become older, and they go to apply for their first job, they can use us as a reference. And we can say, yep, they showed up on time. They were great about, you know, being proactive with the scheduling, helping us with all these projects. And it gives them a, um, kind of a good boost to get into, get some preparation in a low stakes environment for going out to be more independent. Um, and then we also have a monthly planning meeting where they help us develop events and, um, and do things like, you know, we're trying to decide what prize books we want to give away for summer reading. So we give them a list and they vote and they choose the books that everyone is going to get and prizes and things like that. We're working towards getting them to do more event planning stuff and giving them more leadership and ownership. Um, they're all from different schools and most of them are fairly shy. So it's taking, you know, it's been taking a while for them to get comfortable with each other. So we're reaching the point where they're starting to really begin to work as a group. This is only our second year of doing the program and we're working towards getting them to do a little bit more be a little bit more proactive and get some good, you know, leadership and project management skills through TAG. Um, our other big initiative this year is we want um, every single first grade class um, in the Oregon City School District to come through the library on a field trip. We've done three schools so far and we've got three more to go. This year we are doing um, kindergarten instead of first grade for Gaffney Lane. We're transitioning um, towards doing first grade for everybody and Gaffney had come for some kindergarten field trips before. So we're working our way towards eventually getting everyone to do the, um, all of our first grade classes to do the visits. And I've had some really good um, progress with working with some of the SLC and behavior classrooms in the school, dist school district, which are smaller classrooms of kids who have, um, whether they have a diet, um, a specific disability or if for some reason, they're just really struggling in the traditional classroom environment. There's a separate, smaller class with additional teachers that's designed to be a little bit more tailored to um, to those kids. And so we're working to start getting the behavior classrooms in next year as well in a slightly different environment so that they can come and visit the library and be successful on that visit. Um, 
it's really fun, although overwhelming. When we had McLaughlin, we had 120 first graders in and out of the building in under two hours, which was a lot of little humans. Um, so when they're there, they get to do a library tour. Uh, we take them through the library, including the behind the scenes portion with it, where they get to feed Bruno, our automated materials handler. They each get to put a book through. And it's so funny watching them because they put the book through and then they have to watch to see which bit it's going to go in. And if it goes in the one they want, they're like, yes. Um, so they love doing that when we get thank you notes from kids who come on the field trip. Um, there are several that are just like, my favorite thing was feeding Bruno. I love Bruno. I have a um, question. Yeah. Uh, have you done... Is this an ongoing program that you've done for first graders? or is this... this is the first year we're offering it for everybody. We'd offered it for a couple. I'd actually started doing it for North Clackamas Christian School a couple years ago, and it had gone so well for them, and they really enjoyed it that we thought, you know, this is a really good opportunity to do this for everybody. So this year is the first year we're expanding it to all the schools, which has definitely been a learning experience because no two schools are the same, right. you know. It's like, that's, oh, it's a great idea. Yeah, really like I'm really excited about doing it, and it gets them in. We've, one of the things we learned with the Gaffney Lane kindergartners is that they're still just, the kindergartners are still just a little bit too young to really be successful in the field trip and on the tour because there's just too much going on, and they're still really working on getting those, skill, those self control skills down in a new and exciting environment. So that's one of the reasons we're doing the first graders, is we can get them in at the beginning of their you know, school career, get them connected to the library and all the library resources and the books. Um, and so they're young enough to really have that solid foundation, but they're also old enough that they're able to, um, you know, participate in the tour and everything, and it's not too much of a stretch beyond what they can comfortably do. With the Oregon City uh, School mm -hmm. District, does that cover our entire service area, or are there other schools that are So the there are area? some, um, the school district does cover our entire service area of public schools. Um, and one of the schools, Jennings Lodge Candy Lane, is technically located in Milwaukee, um, but we include them because they're run by the school district and a lot of the kids from who are in walking distance from the library are in, um, in that school. I um, reached out to every, I looked up, uh, last year when we did summer reading, um, I had got everybody's school, everyone asked everyone to submit their school. And so I got the names of every school in Oregon City and I contacted every first grade teacher um, and none of the private school teachers responded to me this year, unfortunately. So I'd like to expand it to everybody, and it's been offered to everybody, but the only people who have really responded have been the, um, the traditional elementary school first grade classrooms through the public school system, and even that took a little bit of work to Thank you. Um, get it figured out. Um, so in addition to the library tour, we do a story time. Um, and it's four stories about friendship. Um, we have sort of four reading levels. Um, that we use in the library is sort of an in-house reading system, and each book is a different, um, I call them challenge levels to make them a little bit more value neutral. And so by the end of the story time, the kids know what our four challenge levels in the library are, and they know which type of book, you know, what it looks like inside those books, how many words are on the page, how big those words are, um, in terms of print and in terms of length, and then, then that helps them go and choose. Uh, when they want to go and look at books, they know what level to choose. Um, so that because it can be very overwhelming to go into this big room and try to find a book that you can read when you're still learning to read and so giving them sort of a sense of what their what some of their options are and then telling them I was specifically saying if you need something your just right book was not on this list you know I show them the picture of our ask sign in the library and I'm like go there we will help you find whatever else you need um, so it's a um, and we also I mean they're fun stories and we have a dance break in the middle um, I don't know what I'm going to do when Can't Stop the Feeling by Justin Timberlake stops being a cool kid jam because <laughs> I'm going to be up a creek for story time. Um, and then they, they also have time to explore the children's room. They look at books. Some kids will check out books. Most don't. Um, we do send home library card applications and a letter to parents explaining here's how you get a card. Um, but we found that trying to check, manage kids' library cards on field trips is just way too much because nobody can remember what their PIN number is or they maybe lost a book and then they have to pay for it in order to check out again and it just gets really complicated. So if they do bring their cards and they want to check out, they can. But um, we don't really have the resources to get everybody a card and get them to check out on the field trip. Um, and then they just have some time to read and play. We have our pretend kitchen um, and then our Duplo table, train table, and light table. So there's a lot of um, opportunities to play. And usually that's the point where, you know, they go um, power walking because they can't run in the library past the children's desk. And the person who's there is always saying, you know, 
oh my gosh, they're like, this is the best library ever, because <laughs> they get to go build with Lego. So we really, and that's the other great thing about doing first grade, is they're still young enough that they can really appreciate some of those really fun things about the library, and reading is still generally something interesting and exciting. They haven't, often haven't gotten to that point if they're struggling readers, where it starts to feel really demoralizing. So as much as possible, we're trying to help them when they come into the library, like, give them an experience that introduces them to that sense of like joy and fun and wonder and curiosity that we want them to continue to have um, as they use the library and as they mature and learn and go out to be full-size humans in the world. So it's been really fun, definitely overwhelming, huge learning curve. What works for one school does not work for another, um, but it's we're building a really strong foundation and I'm looking forward to what we'll be able to do next year. Um, so the last six weeks have been sort of a flurry of outreach to schools and community organizations. Um, I think we had, in a six week period, we had eight or nine visits or field trips. Um, so I went to the school district's family focus forum parenting conference um, to share library resources. Um, I went to bingo for books at Jennings Lodge, which is a family literacy night at the dual language school. And we had some leftover Spanish language books from summer reading that we weren't able to give away. So we just gave out books to the students who were there. Um, I presented at the school district's equity conference on finding diverse books for kids and teens, um, which was showing teacher making a bunch of book recommendations um, for diverse books and um, showing teachers how that they how they can assess um, assess um, diverse books and find additional books to use in their classrooms, which was really fun and interesting and wonderful. And I built some really good relationships with the teachers who um, attended that presentation. Um, I went out and did a couple of Head Start story times. My tentative goal is to find, figure out exactly what works in terms of visiting Head Start and be able to get to every class, Head Start classroom in Oregon City um, next year, which is a tall ask, I might not make it. But um, it's been, I will say it's been a little bit challenging so far, um, but I'm, so we're gonna sort of see how it goes and see if this is a really good fit or if we wanna start connecting more with the Head Start families at the parent uh, councils or some other venue. Um, Sabrina went to the High School Career Expo um, to share career resources with <coughs> teens in Clackamas County. Um, they brought our Makey Makey kit and some laptops, which is where you take, um, it's a little electric circuit, you plug one end into your um, computer. The other hand has these clips that you plug into anything that conducts electricity, and in this case, bananas, and then you can, um, you yourself can close the circuit and then play the bananas like a piano using a little web-based app. And it's super fun, highly recommend it. Um, I love doing it with outreach at Teens. My greatest outreach success story of all time came when I was out in Prineville, um, you know, deep ranch and country. And I took this to the high school there, and I had this out on a table. And usually when I went to the high school at lunch, nobody wanted to come talk to me because I was from the library, and that was just not anything they were into. I got an entire group of seven 16-year-old boys to hold hands in a circle to um, make this work, which was not the kind of thing you ever saw. And a couple of them were like trying to touch each other over their clothes. It was like, no, this doesn't work. It only works with skin-to-skin -skin contact. And they're like, all right, let's do it. Let's make this thing light up. Um, and it's just really cool, and it's a great, um, like, Kids and teens are just fascinated by it. It looks like a mad scientist experiment. They want to see how it works. So it's a great way to draw people in and get them talking to you. Um, I've also done it with preschoolers fairly successfully, which you wouldn't think would be possible. Um, and then we did a teacher open house last Friday morning, um, 7.30 a.m., which is too early for anyone to be awake, as far as I'm concerned, bless our teachers who do that every single day. Uh, but we had, um, we actually had about 22 teachers, uh, elementary school teachers, come. It was a planning day. We got permission from all the principals for them to start their work day at the library. We gave them coffee and pastries, got them signed up for educator cards, chatted, schmoozed. Um, a good time was had by all. We also gave away some gift cards for Target and Fred Meyer so they could buy supplies for their classroom. So we'll be offering it again sometime this fall and then making it an annual event in the fall to get teachers in, get them educator cards, and get them connected with the library at the beginning of the school year. Do you want to tell them real quickly what an educator yes, card is? Yes, I do. So an educator card is for certified teachers, um, preschool teachers, um, and <coughs> teachers in after school programs, as well as homeschool families. Um, it's an additional card, in um, so in addition to their personal card that they can use just for materials that in their classroom. Um, they get extra checkouts 
extra, um, they get 80 checkouts and 30 holds, which is more than um, our regular checkout and hold limits. They get to keep the items for six weeks because that's the typical length of a unit that they're doing in their classrooms. And on anything that they're using directly with children in instruction um, on this card, uh, will accrue no late fees. So if they lose the book or damage the book, they will have to pay for it, but they won't be charged any late fees if they don't get things back in time, which is, um, you know, sometimes you've got a stack of things that you're using for a unit and you need to keep it one more day and then you get 25 cents per thing and suddenly you owe, you know, 10 bucks from this, from keeping, you know, your big stack of books for your whole classroom one extra day. Um, so we got, I don't know what that brings our total to, I think we've had at least, this pushes us at least over 50 educator cards this year for sure. So our first year doing it, we're doing countywide. There's been some growing pains as everybody's figuring it out. Um, and there's always that one person who decides they want, they teach elementary school, they want the entire run of Outlander on DVD for six weeks without having to pay late fees. So they check out all of the Outlander DVDs on their educator card for six weeks with no late fees. And Not for the kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because why would you show, you know, your third grade classroom Outlander? Um, so, you know, we are having a little bit of that. Nobody in Oregon City has really been doing that so far, but other libraries have noticed some things. So we're still figuring out those growing pains. And every teacher, I'm like, don't be a jerk. Don't ruin it for everyone. All of our teachers have been really wonderful. And like, of course I wouldn't do that. Like, no, this is, that's not what that's for. Um, so one of our other new things is um, our teen LGBTQ plus collection. Um, we are right across the street from the, um, the living room, which is um, a youth group for LGBTQ <laughs> teens, age 14 to 19 in Clackamas County. So they have a couple, I think Sandy Estica and Estacada now, but um, um, it's, it's sort of a, it's a youth group that serves teens from all over the county. So we have kids coming from Canby, from Malala, coming for, to, to this group as sort of a place where they can socialize and work together. They do an annual um, queer prom for LGBT youth who don't feel comfortable going to traditional proms. They have a special prom that they plan and do at the college, all sorts of other really wonderful resources. And we're literally right across the street. So we have a lot of those youth who are coming to the library before um, they head over to drop in. And they were really trying to connect with books and having such a hard time trying to figure out, find books in the library that reflected them and their lives. So, um, we, um, the Library Foundation funded um, our starter collection and then our regular budget will add a couple um, additional books every month. Um, so we actually worked with the teens at the living room for what types of, to find out what types of books, you know, the, the LGBTQ plus youth in our community wanted from the library, how they wanted the books organized, how they wanted to find them. Um, so we got a ton of input from the teens, so it was very much created with a lot of input from the youth who are designed to, uh, who are going to be using this collection. Um, and it's really wonderful. Everything that we, um, it does make the books easier to find because searching in the catalog can be really difficult sometimes. And so for, for youth who are trying to look for books featuring LGBT characters, it can be really challenging. So this does make it easier. And then uh, for every single fiction book, we have a second copy in our teen fiction section, the, the youth from the living room felt very strongly that they wanted rainbow unicorns on everything. Um, but they also acknowledge that not everybody lives in a home where they can, you know, take home a book with a rainbow unicorn on the spine. So every, there's a second copy in our teen fiction section of everything that has just a regular teen fiction. So if there's anyone who's curious about reading these books for whatever reason, but doesn't feel like a rainbow unicorn sticker is going to be a safe option for them, everything is duplicated without the rainbow sticker. Um, so what's coming up? Spring break starts at the end of next week. Uh, last year we did a really great Alice in Wonderland theme week, and so we've decided to continue the theme week, but we're switching it up with where the wild things are. So um, we have a photo booth that's going to be in the lobby all week that'll have a where the wild things are backdrop for people to take selfies with because we're, we're just in not quite the selfie generation, but the selfie era. People really like it, so we're just gonna keep doing it because it makes them happy. Uh, we're doing a story walk. So one page, uh, we're taking the book Where the Wild Things Are, <clears throat> bought a couple paperback copies on Amazon, cut them up with a box cutter, <laughs> made giant posters of each page of the book so we can hang them in the walls of um, 19 different, or in the windows of 19 different businesses downtown. 
So uh, families can come to the library anytime, March 21st to 31st, grab a map. They start at the library, walk down to the Friends Bookstore, then come by City Hall and take the elevator down to Main Street. They'll go up and down Main Street and then come back along 6th Street past the Ermitinger House and to the library. And by the time they're done, they will have read the entire book, Where the Wild Things Are. Um, it's great to do over spring break because so many families are traveling, but they're not traveling the whole time. They're doing just bits and pieces here and there. Um, so it's, um, you know, trying to get everybody in the library for an event can be really hard. But um, do the story walk, they can drop in and do any time. They can do it any time we're open, um, and they get a little prize when they finish. Um, our weekly art lab will be where the wild things are themed. People really love paper bag puppets, so we're going to do paper bag puppets. And then we're having a wild rumpus on March 28th, which is literally we're going to put sticky jewels on some fake crowns and then have a dance party to like Motown and get everybody's extra energy out by the end of spring break, or at the end of spring break, because they're all a little stir crazy from being home. Um, our other big annual event is May the 4th. May the 4th be with you, Star Wars Day. We have our big annual party. Um, we usually bring in the 501st Legion of uh, cosplayers who dress up as stormtroopers and come in and, you know, just interact with the kids and hang out and, you know, duel them. Um, kids love building lightsabers out of pool noodles and duct tape. I don't know what it is. Um, and then they like to go out and, like, you know, we let them run wild in the spray park with a bubble machine and hit each other with the lightsabers. Um, and then we just have, like, carnival games and scavenger hunts and all sorts of other good things to do. Uh, we had over 500 people attend last year with everybody going in and out the doors. Our door count was something like almost 1,000 in the evening. So it's, it's bonkers. People love it. Um, summer reading is coming. Um, it runs June 1st to, through September 1st. We're expecting um, almost 3,000 um, kids and teens to register this year. Um, we're working on getting to every single elementary school to do um, a presentation at, their, at a morning assembly. Um, or just like a school-wide assembly. When we did that at Beaver Creek last year, we doubled the registration numbers. So we're really hoping to get, get more kids in this year. I've got a picture here of just some of our prize books spread out in the community room. That's like 2,000 of them. Um, so yeah, we're hoping to, uh, and we're also going to the middle school and high school libraries during lunch to promote the teen summer reading program to the older kids. So well, um, every kid who signs up gets a free book to take home and keep. We wanted to make sure that everybody was starting off with having a book to take home and not just saving a book as a reward for the end because we'd rather get as many books into kids' hands as possible. <coughs> and then we also work with local businesses, and then the county cooperates region-wide for some other goodies that kids can get as coupons. This year, one of our sign-up coupons is a discounted Oaks Park ride bracelet, um, free mini golf at Bullwinkle's, uh, last year, we're hoping we can get this again. Last year, Mike's gave every kid who signed up a free ice cream cone, which is, and Mike's driving is right across the street from the library, so people loved it. Um, and then we also offer activities to entertain and educate children when they're outside of school. So we'll be doing story times in the art lab all through the summer, uh, but we're going to bring back our family concert series every Wednesday morning in the library park. We're going to keep those young teen maker crafty programs going every Friday. Uh, we partnered with the o uh, OSU Extension to offer um, teen cooking classes every week, and then we'll be having monthly teen movies. Um, we're still working on this. Fingers crossed it all comes together, but we're hoping that we can use the Tot Park across the street from the library as a free summer food site. Um, so it's, it's the equivalent to the free lunch programs at the elementary schools. During the summer, they will offer them in different places around the community. Anyone can come get a free lunch, you know, no questions asked. It'll just be available. We were hoping to do it in the library park, but be, you can only do it in areas where 50% or more of the neighborhood qualifies for free or reduced lunch. Because between the McLaughlin neighbor, the value, the value of homes in the McLaughlin neighborhood and the number of businesses around the library, we are literally on the other side of Jefferson Street from the service area. So we cannot offer a free lunch in the library park, but the top park, because it's on the other side of Jefferson Street, we can offer a lot. I know, it's the silliest thing ever. And this, I talked to the, the guy at the school district who does all of this, and he was just like I, like, I contacted them directly and tried to get them to do an override. They wouldn't do it. So providing everything shakes out the way we're planning, there will be a summer food site right across the street from the library, and it will, we'll schedule it to be so that, you know, you can come to the family concert and then go get free lunch across the street and try to get it scheduled sort of near our events. You can come to the library and then just go across the street for a free lunch. Um, 
I mean, it would be great to have it at the library because there's less stigma <coughs> of coming to the library, you know, because there's less stigma of coming to the library than going to a free summer food site but, um, or a dedicated summer food site. So we're still, still working on it, but it will be great to have those free lunches right there by the park to get, get uh, food to kids who need it. Um, and we're expecting it to be another very busy summer. We had uh, 4,500 people attend events last summer, so we expect this summer will be about the same. Um, and that is my wrap up. If you have questions, you can ask me now, or I've got information on how to contact me. Um, I can answer any and all general questions, and if you have teen-specific questions, um, you can always contact Sabrina as well. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so some of your events, there's um, a lot of attendance. Mm -hmm. And so what have you found is your best marketing tool for the community to know about these events? Ooh, that is a good question. A lot of it is word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So people telling other people mm -hmm. about it. Um, I will say when, once things go on our calendars, we have a monthly events calendar that mm -hmm. we hand out in the library and usually like a lot of our, the people who come are often just people who are in the library all the time and they see yeah. it as a fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely, I mean, we have a lot of attendance for stuff that people really enjoy doing. So being able to tailor our programs, getting mm -hmm. a better sense of what the community likes and being able to tailor programs that are just interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I know we we do try to track what happens on Facebook um, mm -hmm. and there are certain events where we'll have a lot of, there are a lot of people who are, you know, liking or being interested in our events on Facebook, which will sometimes be a determined. But I would say like a lot of the people who come, you know, we have a lot of people who are there, but it's not, you know, I talked about those 4,500 people for coming, coming for summer reading. It's not 4,500 different faces. It's often mm -hmm. the same families every week and even the same families coming multiple times in a week mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of hard to get a get a finger on what is working mm -hmm. and isn't working marketing wise but we tend to see i think a lot from our event calendar just because we're already we're reaching people who are already in the library and then we do have a fair fair amount of uh we're able to slowly start pushing into new markets um, yeah. on facebook too okay that's my best yep. guess I've got just a little tiny comment on that too. The city did a survey and they asked people like what was the best way to get news and so many people, I can't remember the exact percentage, they said the trail news and we do have things yes. listed in the trail news. So even though that's like, you know, a hard copy thing that doesn't always have like accurate last minute information because things change or every single program, people still really do rely on that. Yeah, definitely. Trail news. Which what, is tricky because what is go. trail news? It's like a pamphlet that comes out quarterly. It's like a newspaper print pamphlet that's like three quarters size kind of thing, two thirds, three quarters, and it's just got listing of all the activities in the city. And it's um, well, I just know it includes the city, but it also includes more than the city, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Well, it's the um, so it's like all the things that parks and recreation offers, all the things that the senior center offers, all the things that the pool offers. Uh, library so pretty much city departments and I think maybe maybe some county yeah, maybe services some but county it's stuff, basically yeah. uh, programs and services offered by city it, departments that are for the general public I think it only goes to city residents though yeah mm -hmm. so that's a limiting factor for that is a limiting yeah. factor yeah yeah I had a question yeah unless somebody else wants I know the uh, foundation is looking at uh, Dolly Barton imagination yes. project how does that I, I, it may be too early in the process, but I, I was just curious how that would uh, fit in with what you have going so far. Um, that is a great question. I know they're in the very early stages. I can talk about what I know that the Canby Public Library and the Wilsonville Public Library do. Um, and so their libraries um, at their children's desk, their like registration points for Dolly Parton Imagination Library, as far as I understand. And so they promote the program and they sign families up for the program through the library, um, and then they partner with their local organizations to secure funding for the kids in the community okay. who register. So I think, and Mo, I know Mo has been more involved in the, the research process so far. So that's how, that's how at this point I imagine it working. I could be very wrong. I know it's pretty early <laughs> yeah, in the process, so, so I wasn't, I, so we'll I didn't see. know if it was, you know, being discussed but, or whatever. Yeah, but it's the kind of thing that, you know, certainly promoting it, getting kids registered at story times, through programs, other things to really be, because we're connecting with so many young kids and families through the library, we're a really great. Since you're touching so many people yes. through all your programs. So many people. Um, I wondered if there was an opportunity to, to talk about the cultural passes. 
Mm-hmm. I, I just see, I just feel like that's so underused. And when I talk with people about it, that, you know, it's like they, they were not, you know, there's not a, I think there's an awareness, but I don't know how broad it is. And it's, there's a lot of good things for families on that would be cultural yeah. passes. You know, we don't really do it. You're, we don't really do a ton of promotion for the cultural passes in the children's room. Although we do have a lot of families who are aware of it. I think, um, I think in particular right now we're getting ready to launch a new online cultural pass booking <coughs> program on April 1st. And so I think as we roll out um, ePass, which is the software, that will give us a really good opportunity to promote it in general okay. in the children's room and throughout the library just because I know that when I went to the Family Focus Forum, I brought the Cultural Pass um, brochure and I was telling so many people, did you know we have cultural passes? And these the parents were like, what? That's awesome. And I had probably three different people say, oh yeah, we use those. I really wish you offered online booking because it's such a pain. And I was like, coming this spring, online booking. That's great. So, I, I like that. Yeah, so I think the online booking will really help in terms of making it, it'll give us a great promotion opportunity. It'll make it um, more user friendly for a lot of people. And then also we'll see the same people using the passes over and over again. And the online system will block it to, I think, one pass usage per card per year. So it'll free them some of the, not that we have a ton of people who do it, but it will put some. I have one more question. Yeah, go. Um, library to go. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's an opportunity like at the high school to promote library to go because, you know, everyone has their, yeah. smartphones and other things and I, I just again I feel like there I don't know what the awareness is for yeah. library to go like in the in the high school yeah. it just seems like that'd be a great we, opportunity we do a little bit um the um the Oregon City School District is actually one of the most um <coughs> proactive in the state at buying ebooks um, and digital audiobooks for their school libraries oh, wow. so okay. they have an equivalent to the downloadable option the downloadable it's the same as the overdrive app but they call it Sora instead of Libby for schools and so um, the school district is still trying to get widespread adoption of, of their own in-house ebook usage. And so it's a thing I've been talking about with the media assistants when I go to their monthly meetings, when I've been talking to teachers that, hey, we have library downloads too. You can do library to go and you can do cloud library. Mm -hmm. So it offers a lot of benefits. One of the things that I think is really funny is um, a lot of teens have become very resistant to the concept of ebooks. You know, I'll offer things as an ebook, and they're like, no, I want to read the paper book, or I want to read the real book. And I'm like, you know, format is just, you know, a paper book is just an arbitrary format. <laughs> like, the words are the same. But there are some kids who are real hardcore format snobs, and they talk about wanting to smell the books. And, <laughs> I, you know, I know. I have a grandson like that, so I can relate. Yeah. I mean, and I'm like, but I, I want the convenience of being able to read on my phone you know, in bed or to listen to an audiobook wherever I am and not have to find a disc player because who has those anymore? So, yeah, I mean, it is one of those things we do promote. And we I like the idea of promoting, I mean, in general, when we're doing outreach into the community, because one of the barriers to using the library is often not having access, not being, particularly for kids not having transportation to get to the library. Right. So, so having, and also another big thing is the late fees. Their parents don't want them to check out stuff that they might then have to pay for that the family can't afford. And so the nice thing about digital downloads is you don't have to be able to get to the library um, to be able to do those downloads. And then there's no late fees. They just automatically expire at the end, end time. Um, and I come to this partly from coming from rural or real, real rural Oregon before I was here, um, where a lot of people didn't have internet access at home. And I know for, um, you know, a lot of the kids who might ha be in families where for economic reasons they have transportation issues or, um, you know, their parents might not be able to afford, you know, late fees or damaged books or things like that. Like, those might also be environments where having an internet connection or reliable internet connection is a little, a little dicey. And they can certainly, but they can down, they have free Wi-Fi at school and if they can't get to the public library, free, free Wi-Fi at the library. So, definitely. There's a lot of opportunities there, especially in terms of access for people who can't, who have for tr primarily transportation and economic reasons can't get to the library. Thank you. Yeah. A question. Yeah. You said you've been operating a teen advisory group for two years now. Yes. Have any of the people involved in that expressed an interest in becoming librarians? That is a good question. <clears throat> Nobody in my current batch, our current batch has. Um, I'm not as, as involved with the tag here as I was when I was at my last um, job, but when I was, um, it definitely does happen. I was 
when I was in grad school, my first like li real real world library experience was helping run a teen advisory group in Illinois, and we had at least one kid from that group who was like, I want to be a librarian. Um, but we see a lot of kids who are, um, I think the kids who are really engaged with the teen advisory group are often kids who are, um, they're either really super into the library and they just really like the library and like being there and like reading. And they don't necessarily want a career in libraries, but they're really into books and what the library can offer the community. And I've also seen the library be a really great place for kids who don't really fit in anywhere else, particularly because you know, you can come and, part, you know, do stuff at the library and become part of a, like, a community in a way that doesn't require money. Um, and I see, I see fewer kids in Oregon City who come from that background just because of the, you know, the average income level. We have more kids who are involved in sports or music or extracurriculars, but it's, you know, it's often a, you know, a place that kids come because there are other, you know, there's not really another place that they fit, and the library is a really good opportunity for that. And, I mean, and they're all such wonderful, interesting, quirky humans. It's been really fun to get to know them. Great. Well, now you know who to talk to whenever you have questions about the children's and the teen stuff. Thank you so much for that. That was, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really right. informative. You're welcome. All right. Unplug all of my... Yeah. Oh, I guess I can try and do that. We'll move on to <coughs> item number four. <coughs> Library director's report. Right. Um, well, one of the things we are working on in a uh, lot in February seem to be behavior issues, and we'll be talking about the behavior policy later. But it felt like we spent a lot of time and energy on behavior issues. I don't know if it was the weather. I don't know what it was, but it did it did force us to kind of reevaluate how many warnings we were giving people and letting them slide by with. And so um, the upside, as I mentioned in my report, was that we feel like we've made some really um, tighter connections with um, Robin Schmidt at Father's Heart and with Mike Day from the Oregon City Police Department. So that's super helpful when you have people that you can call um, when there's things going on because the issues that we were having primarily had to do with people who happened to be homeless, but not by any means all. So um, not to give you like the wrong impression. Thank you so much, Barrett. We'll see you later. All right. Um, and that building stuff that we are, we did that big building project in October where we did like the uh, baffles and all that stuff. That's done, but then we decided to do more um, sound stuff down in the um, staff area. And it, it just is like super slow to get any kind of work done these days because all the workmen are so, so busy. So that is, um, that is happening, but very, very slowly. And you know, they're just, um, other than thinking about stressed staff and burnout issues, there wasn't a lot going on. The that you know took up plenty of time. The statistics are looked very good for last month, um, as compared to the same month last year. We were up in door count. We were up in circulation of materials. We were down in one I like to be down in, which is the difference. Um, the holds that we were getting from other libraries. I mean, that last year at this time, it was 6,300, and we were down to 3,600. So, I mean, that's significant, and that makes me feel really good. So our collections are definitely improving. But otherwise, I was sitting there thinking, what did we do in February? It snowed. It was miserable. Um, we wanted it to be June. Um, otherwise, you know, it was just kind of, Day in, day out. Yeah. Any questions? All right, we'll uh, move on then. Okay. Item five, the behavior policy. Okay. So um, I brought this to you last month, and you had a request that. Um, it'd be a little more clear as to when things might happen. Like 
leave it a little bit less up in the air and a little bit, bit less subjective. Um, so I went through this thing word by word and we actually, I've got the copy that I sent to you hopefully had the um, red, red print for things that changed. Um, so the first group of things, which are the, like smaller infractions, you know, the lighter infractions, um, I did kind of go a little bit crazy on how many violations and what would happen, but I wanted to leave like a lot of options there. Um, sometimes even though they're like really small <coughs> violations, when they're repeated, they just drive you crazy, you know? And nobody should be allowed to get away with like repeated things over and over and over. So I just really felt like I needed to address that. And then I did want to take you, um, your attention down to number seven, where it says consuming food except in specially designated areas. You know, food's not allowed in the library. And I have to tell you, when somebody um, wants to eat a sandwich, they got it Father's Heart, and you're sending them back outside, it's, 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 really, it's really tough. It's, it's like, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? So we've talked about um, designating some very specific areas that we could say, also to people like moms who want to give their kid a cracker so that they like feel a little bit better. It really shouldn't be in the children's area with it getting into all the Legos, you know what I mean? So it would be really nice to have one place in the library to say, go eat there. Um, so we changed that rule so that we could in the future at least have a specifically designated area. So that's what's going on with seven. With number 14, you'll notice that I said, footwear with soles must be worn while in the library. Previously, it was just no bare feet. Well, we had some people challenge us on that. They're walking around in their socks and they were not happy that we were making them put shoes on. So I wanted to be very clear about that. And then um, number 15 on the back side um, about offensive odors. You know, like we need to be able to send people away if the odor is just so very strong that it's disturbing other people. But once that issue is taken care of, people are absolutely more than welcome to come back. You know, and that could be taken care of relatively simply in many cases, you know, if people have access to. Um, the, the right cleaning facilities or whatever. So that's why I added that little thing. And then um, on the bottom, I added the appeal process at the very end. <laughs> and hopefully I've addressed the concern that you had from last month. Need to, uh, this needs to be, yeah, moved and approved if you're okay with it. Looks good to me. Yeah. Okay, because we can always revise it as well. You know. Is there a motion? I move. Second. Second. All right, all those in favor of accepting the behavior rules governing the use of the Oregon City uh, Public Library say aye. 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 Those opposed to say no. All right, approved. Move on to item six, the budget and budget process. All right. So in February, we got an estimate of um, what we will get from the district for next, next year. Um, and it's basically a 3% increase. And they basically tell us that every single year. That's what they expect. One of these years, there's going to be a tipping point, and it's not going to happen. But so far, it's been that plus more, actually. But they want to be very, very conservative so that whatever we base our budget on is, um, you know, it's within range. So, um, so we got that. And then we also got figures from the um, city as to, like, where we are year to date and what they project us um, being. So what we do is we sit down with that and go through it and think about like, well, do we agree with the city on what those figures are going to end up being? Or are they looking at something that was a one-time thing and so therefore they doubled something that doesn't need to be doubled or whatever? So we've gone through all that um, with the expectation that we will still get the same city 
um, contribution of $150,000 on top of our district money and um, and and our projection so far is that we're in pretty good shape but of course at this point in time it's all just estimates you know we've beefed up some things and other things we could go a little bit lighter on um, I would say what did we beef up we beefed up staff development we beefed up a little bit of maintenance some collections, those kinds of things. So we're still on the maintenance and cost of the building. We're still in that those early stages where, you know, we want to make sure we have enough. Um, so it's looking pretty good, um, but we haven't had any final conversations with the finance department and sometimes what they do as far as their contribution to us is going to depend on some of the other you know departments because that money comes out of general fund so i'm going to really try to you know make the case that this is important to stick with what they've been doing they need to stay with that amount um, and it all looks pretty positive at the moment um, but I don't have I don't have like a sheet of specifics for you. So that's just kind of the next step would be in two weeks, two weeks or so, I'll meet with um, the city manager. And I think at that point in time, the city will be able to tell me a little bit more about their contribution from the general fund. I'm hoping I don't awesome. want to be without it. Yes. In the, in the discussion about the strategic plan, if I recall correctly, there was another position to be added this next year. Is that in the budget? There was another position. I don't remember a position. I thought what? it was. I thought you were requesting for the next year that you were going to add at least one position. Mm -hmm. I, no, not us. Hmm. No. Um, what we're what we're doing is um, we have a forty hour a week position that is going to become available to us in um, April 1st, actually, before the next biennium. And um, that position we're going to be able to modify. So what we hope to do is back it down to a 25 hour a week position and then have those extra 15 um, hours per week to distribute to other positions. So for instance, um, maybe the 32 hour a week people that we have now can get bumped up to 40. So we have three of those. So we're hoping that would all work out. And that way we would still have that work being done by the person who, um, by the position that will have a new person in it. And we'll actually be able to, like the person who supports Barrett that she described as 32 hours a week, that could get bumped to 40 potentially. So if that all works out, that would be really great because then there would be more help at the department level. That would really help a bunch. The, yeah. uh, the idea of 32 hour a week people, mm -hmm. is that a, a uh, uh, scheduling people for 32 hours a week? Has that to do with fringe benefits or what? what's the rationale for 32? Well, anything above um, 20 <laughs> hours a week gets um, benefits as far as, you know, all the vacation and everything else, health care, all that stuff. So um, that's one reason why we have so many people who work under 20 hours a week. But a lot of that also has to do with the flexibility that we need to have having a seven day a week operation. Mm -hmm. So 32, I can't remember how we landed there. They were 30. Uh, they were 30. Then we gave them two more yeah. or something. Yeah. We managed to do two more, but because we couldn't actually afford 40. Yeah. But the thing that's funny is that, or ironic, is that when you're at 32, basically your benefits are already full time. So adding the hours doesn't add that much more cost. So it's really a very cost effective way to get more hours, staff hours in the library. Gotcha. Yeah. So that could be very helpful if that works out that way. And that, and that should work out but I just don't want to make any promises. Not that this is broadcast or anything, but you know, yeah. So it looks like we should be in pretty good shape next year anyway, you know, without giving specifics. I feel pretty confident about what we're heading into. 
And that this is for the, the next biennium, so it's two years. So that would be even better. All right, anything else? Questions, all right, we'll uh, move on to uh, item, agenda item number seven, communications. Uh, Nick, do you wanna go first and tell us about Beldac? Sure, we didn't meet, so oh, all right. <laughs> pretty easy. <laughs> It was weather related. Mm -hmm. oh. Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. All right, Ken, you were uh, just at the Friends of the Library meeting? Yes. Um, <coughs> the new bookstore is looks looking good. They've got new carpet in, they've painted the interior walls. Um, and uh, looks like everything is pretty much on schedule. Um, Today, they, the owner was at the meeting and of the building, and, they, and uh, the people signed the lease agreements. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think anybody read them very thoroughly, but nobody ever does anyway. They, they said they read them ahead of time. They've already received copies. <laughs> Have your lawyer read them, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to... Right now, they're running 50% off all books until they close the old library. So if you old bookstore, really, all books, I said old bookstore, you said old library. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure we were. Yeah, at the old library, at the old bookstore, old bookstore. I'm yes, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> OK, at the old bookstore. And uh, they're really encouraging people to come in and load up. Yeah. Um, let's see. They're going to close the library on the 31st of this month, mm -hmm. or not the bookstore, the old bookstore. And they're going to planning on opening a new bookstore on the 15th of April. And then they're going to have the grand opening May 1st. So they might even get everything back <coughs> up and looking good by then. Um, there is some expenditures, but they're being very thrifty about it. I think they're doing a great job. Anything else? No, I think you got it. They, um, they are looking for volunteers to help them pack books and unpack books. They need, um, do they need trucks? Yeah, they're going to lean on Pam at B&B Leasing because, of course, they know, you know, they're related to the foundation people. Um, and they don't have to start paying rent until May 1st, which is nice. That's right. And they've got a good, healthy savings account. Mm -hmm. And they make sure they're going to stop the rent at the other place. Yes, exactly. On the first. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Uh, Cynthia, Library Foundation. Uh, foundation did not meet in February, okay. but we will be meeting next week. And the major topic of um, discussion will be the Dolly Parton Imagination Library Project. And we'll be, be seeing a, a brief PowerPoint that explains the whole thing and then having some information and discussion about community partners, benefits to the community, and steps to move forward. So it ought to be a good meeting. A lot of, I think, good activities will come out of that. All right, thank you, Nick, Cynthia, and Ken for representing us at all of these meetings. And I guess we'll move on to item H, future agenda items. I know, Mo, you were going to fill us in on the latest with Link. Oh, right. So um, as you, I think I've mentioned before, Greg Williams from the Library Network was promoted up to business and service whatever it's like the, the one of the major departments of the county and so replacing him was um, a big task that we've been working on I was on the interview panel and um, recently they hired Catherine Cole who was working already in that office so she just like has been also promoted herself then her first day was in that position was March 9th so now they'll have to start working on replacing her. You know, it's a vicious cycle when you hire from within, but it's all good because they're all great people. 
So I'm very much looking forward to working with Catherine in that position, and she's going to be great. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. I'm sure Josh is happy too. I'm sure Josh is happy. <laughs> is there uh, any uh, new business or unfinished business? Uh, since there is no further business, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>